um, January 84, which is 18 years. I knew somebody who went to the press launch of the QL and got their guff back, which said it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it looked very good on the press launch. Well, it still looks good today, but the press launch was launching something that didn't exist. I got my first QL in about May. May of the same year. Same year. Yeah. With the dongle at the back. Ah, uh, well, the dongle looked something like that. Yeah, sitting over the back of the room. That's not a dongle. I'll explain what that is later. Um, and it worked. But if you tried to do anything sensible with it, of course, it didn't. Anyway, it got sent back within two months of me getting it for upgrade to a real QL, and it got lost in the post. But it was insured, so I bought another one. Mind you, in those days, it was £350 maximum, so I lost £49 across my postage. Uh, anyway, I got my QL back, and I got another QL, and that was a long story, of course, around there. I won't go into that. But it was crashing all the time. So, this is how I arrived in the QL scene. As a trader. As a trader, computer cleaner. And that arrived in, oh, middle of 85. And that's all I was around to do. But I got to know the QL and the insides of it, and I started. But no, what started it was Sid Day, who not many people around today will remember him unless they've been in since about 89, because he died quite early on. But he bought a lot of Sinclair parts, and he had a garage in Essex full of parts, and I bought boxes of QL bits and components and so on. And I started repairing them and selling the components, and then it sort of moved on from there. Oh, my QL test kit. That's not the original one. The original one got lost on the famous accident on the way to Croatia, 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 the QL show at Croatia. Can't you try and say that quickly. But that's the QL test kit, which is a, a serial loopback lead and a QL ROM, which you saw earlier. That's the dongle ROM. Um, but that contains a QL test ROM and it goes through various things. There's nothing terribly sophisticated, but it makes sure you test all the aspects of the QL. And that has been. Uh, 800 QLs? I don't know, a lot. I've seen a lot of QLs. Um, but then products sort of started appearing and I started selling Minerva. I suppose that was the, oh no, no, the first thing was I set up a VBS and then Tony Price started writing software for the QL that worked better than the current software. Um, that was the next product, I think, QL Terminal. And I sold Astrocoms for a while. I suppose after Minerva, I squared C interfaces. For, for Minerva, which sort of drive robots and read temperatures. And one of them has been reading temperature on my BBS since about 95 on the BBS. Uh, every 10 minutes since 1995. Um, what came next? Hermes. Oh, Hermes actually were out of order. Hermes came before the I2C interfaces. And that was to replace the QL Z049, which was and the, the ludicrous thing about it was, it was replacing it with an identical, in terms of, in, in terms of code, in terms of the hardware. And what it did is identical hardware. And Lawrence Rees wrote the code better. Uh, it's ridiculous, really, that they didn't do the right they job did it properly in the, in the first place. Yeah. So we we got Hermes, which basically cured all the problems on the QL except the speed. You couldn't, in theory, you could go 9200, but you couldn't because the QL wasn't fast enough. To, or the 8049 wasn't fast enough to process it. So, it was all been sitting in the back of our minds that we ought to produce a faster serial port. So, I said to Lawrence, well, let's produce a faster serial port. And we sort of chose a pick that might be suitable, which was able, which had inbuilt serial port, basically, except for handshaking. Um, but it developed from there, and what we produced was Super Hermes, which is an interesting piece of kit, which is has a keyboard interface, it has the serial port, that was the original feature, yeah. it has mice, it has key lock, key lock's an interesting one, but I thought, oh I must use key lock, and I put, put that on and it worked, and then I spent quite a long time one day trying to work out why Super Hermes had stopped working, until I realised that the key that I put in the key lock had slipped. I only twigged when I started to use the mouse. And the mouse was working, but the key clicks on the mouse weren't working. This is a really clever thing about the code, that Lawrence didn't bother to remove the code to remove the mouse, because what was the point? You can move it around. As long as you remove the key clicks, then you can't do anything with the mouse, other than move the pointer around. 
So that was the clue. Um, caps lock LED, e, uh, e squared prom, which can store, well, the only commercial use of that at the moment is um, Cubide. We went to the US show in 19. What year was it? 1995, I think. Uh, yeah, about that. 1995. And we had lots of orders, potential orders from there, and we were going to launch it in America. And about six weeks before an open show, we discovered a problem with it. We couldn't work out what it was. It was the keyboard was not seeming to work properly. We were getting jittering on the keyboard. To cut a long story short, we found out it was a problem with the pick, a bug in the pick. So that was it. We could we 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 didn't have time to rejig Super Hermes for America. So what Lawrence did, he'd done most of the code, the raw code. So we just rejigged it quickly such that it would emulate Hermes. Um, yeah, emulate Hermes completely. So it would work as a standard Hermes, except it was better than Hermes because it runs faster and everything. So it is a better Hermes. And then the, we sold, in America, we sold about 15 at the launch to people there, which it wasn't a Super Hermes. And then we had to upgrade something like 60 with the new code, and of course Microchip didn't contribute towards this at all. But the end of the story is that they have never asked back, asked for this emulator back. So Lawrence still has it. And if you go to his website, you can see he advertises this in circuit emulator on his website. That's one of the things he can do in life. Super Hermes. Um, you want to get, you know, get, any, get any word here? Come on, you've got to say something. Like oh, right, well, um, you're meant to be interviewing me. Uh, well, you're paddling on, that's great. <laughs> that's what we want. Um, okay, no, um, after Super Hermes and, and Hermes, you got the, one of the ones I liked, because I bought one straight away. Is ROM Disk. Absolutely. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> ROM, that's a two megabyte ROM Disk, simply just so I leave off the chips, but you fill up the slots on ROM Disk, and you can get up to eight megabytes, and it's it's like having a hard, portable hard disk. I've taken that to America many, many times. I just take that. That's my QL. And I borrow a QL over there. Well, no, it's not that, just that. I put in a uh, Minerva into it, and Super Herbies, or whatever. And I've got all my boot code, all my test programs, everything. When did the ROM disk come out? Was it sort of 96, 97? 90, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. 88, 98. 98, I think. Oh, wait a minute. Let's read this. It'll say copyright on here. Somewhere, it'll say copyright TF services 1988. 98. 1998. Yeah, that's sort of before Compact Flash became sort of a portable. Oh, it was before that was that came out, yeah. More or less the same thing. The, the reason this year. happened, though, was, and we, we have to put credit where credit's due, that Dick Hardy sells, um, they call it a Flash Eprom. Flash Eprom. Well, it isn't, of course. Yeah. It's mis been misnamed ever since it started, but there we are. And I designed the circuit board for that, um, which is basically just mimicking the Z88 circuit board. And I showed this to Stuart in Eindhoven, and Stuart said, hmm, why can't we do this with the QR? And then we sort of designed it on the way home from Eindhoven, and that's what came. Oh, M-Plane, that's the other bit of goodies I've got there. That one won't, probably won't fit in I have to put it up there for you to see M plane. Um, that's basically how it works with a, with a QL. So that it's fairly solid and it doesn't fall to bits. Whereas most people who know that you take it through parcel force and the whole Q plane out, it just falls to bits, even if it's fixed together. Whereas that one screws on. It's M plane. When did we do this M plane? It was about two years ago, three years ago. Three years ago. I think it was there, the. the Minus QL. Well, that's what it was used for. for that's what it's for, and it fits in in Q branches Minus QL. Uh, well, Keith Mitchell basically thought of the Minus QL, up. and it was designed to fit into that. And on the Minus QL environment, there's a reset connector on there, and you have a button coming out for the reset yeah. connector. Yeah. It has a ROM port on it, which can actually be on the other side as well. Yeah. If you watch, so in 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 the Minus QL, you can have a removable ROM disk. Um, it's the, the, the way that it works so well here with Super Gold Card sitting nicely on there. You have to cut away the ROM port, but it doesn't matter if you've got the ROM port there. And you lose one joystick port, but I don't think many people use QL joysticks, I haven't seen them. But the way it fits there is totally accidental. There's a hole in the QL circuit board that, that Gold, Gold Card has a screw there that goes straight through the hole. That's purely accidental. We weren't thinking of it in terms of the motherboard, this motherboard at all. 
Uh, but it works, it overlaps slightly, it overlaps slightly. It's slightly higher, that Super Gold card is higher than the motherboard, purely because we were designing it around Nasta's Goldfire and he had to mount the RAM slightly higher because it was physically wouldn't fit. So that socket is higher than that socket. And because of that, it just slots in very nicely over the motherboard and screws in tightly. So it, it's, it's without even screwing on anything, it's still solid. Easy. But that was pure luck that, that it worked that way. And even more so, it was luck that the fact that I designed the circuit board, because it's very difficult when you're designing on, on a PC package to know which is component side and which isn't. And I got it the wrong way around in my mind, but I designed it the wrong way around. Keith had actually designed all the holes in his prototype the wrong way around, because I had told him the wrong way around. When we got there, with the first production unit, and I set it up, Keith said, ah, that's the wrong way around. I couldn't do it any other way. That's the way I had to manufacture it. And because of it, it works like that. If I'd done it the other way around, it wouldn't have worked. But we only realized that after I'd had 100 boards made. But it worked. <sighs> and the last one, of course, is the comp cleaner, the comp switch. Oh, the comp switch, which yeah. is very He's clever. with it now. Yeah. I have a comp switch that looks very much like like the, oh, the cleaner. Oh, the cleaner, spot the difference. There's not a lot of difference. Um, comp switch is, well, a lot of people, and now the situation's changed slightly. But when I first produced comp switch, um, it was for ATX machines, because ATX machines, you lose the power out, the mains out connector. So, because manufacturers say, well, the monitors switch themselves automatically, don't they? But they forget about sca USB scanners, they forget about sound systems, they forget about external modem. All those basically sit on all the time. They can't be switched off other than with a main switch. And of course, you haven't got a switch on the ATX because the ATX knows better and it says it's a soft switch and all it does is switch off the ATX power supply, nothing else. So, with comp switch, you plug into that socket I call it computer, but it doesn't need to be a computer, it could be anything into there. And when you switch that on, the computer or whatever on, then the other three sockets switch off, on, switch on. And when you switch the computer off, the other sockets switch off. And so with an ATX, you can actually turn the computer off by clicking shutdown. And Roy Wood actually has a very nice use for it. He puts a light in it. I said, what do you want a light in it? You can put a light in the wall. He said, ah. My computer takes maybe five minutes to shut down at night, so I set the computer to shut down. I go and brush my teeth. If I look upstairs and the light is off, I know the computer's it's off. Shut down. It's very clever. Yeah. Which is nice. But you can also use it with QLs. You can put a QL monitor in there and use the switch socket to switch the QL system on and off. You not use it for hi-fi, though. Like and you use it for hi-fi. Somebody uses it with lights yeah. in their switch room. Off your computer they can switch their the light. All the lights, they're, they're, they use standard lamps in the room. And they're all connected to the comm switch, and you switch one standard alarm off, and all the rest go off. So it's um, quite a range of cutting. products. And that's it. Lovely. Well, thanks I very think much. It's probably something you've forgotten. But yeah, I'm sure there's something in there. Okay, thanks very much, Tony, for talking to us. Taking the time to have a chat. I'm taking the time at all. <laughs> I happen to be here. <laughs> Thank you.